Okay, I'm just gonna be upfront right away. I did not like fairy tales. What is fairy tales? I'm sure at least like three of you have asked. Well, it's a spin off show of a couple of quick, short animations of the in universe fairy tales of Ruby. Not too dissimilar to Pyrrha's recounting of the Four Maidens or Crow telling us about the relics, only this series has a bit more effort put into its animations, and these fairy tales come from the other supplemental material, the fairy tales book, written by by E.C. Myers. And, uh... I didn't like it. Full disclosure, I have not read the book, and I have no real plans of ever really reading this book, but that should be fine, right? This is an adaptation of those works, right? So reading the book shouldn't be necessary to fully enjoy and understand these animations, right? <laughs> So before we get into the episodes proper, I just wanted to give some quick thoughts on the show overall. I was not very excited to watch these shorts for a number of reasons. One, I don't like this animation style. It's not bad by any means, and this is my most subjective take for this review. If you think this looks great, that's totally valid. Some shots look fantastic, especially the environments. Not everything is good, and I'll point out some of the extra good and extra bad as we go, but I have two two big issues with this style. First of all, I can't help but feel like this animation style is really lazy. I understand the concept of going with this style of animation. Not only does Rooster Teeth use this style a lot for its other less successful shows, but it does also give the impression of being from a storybook. These look almost as if illustrations from a children's story have come to life, and it's cute. But where I think it falls flat is in the details. I understand how the vector are working with these characters' as limbs and faces. But you know who else does animation like this? Ever After High. And it's clear just by putting these two shows side by side that there's a huge difference in quality. The thing that really gets me is the lack of the flow with their hair and their accessories. Everything tends to just stick in one place with fairy tales, where in Ever After High, their different locks of hair and their earrings and other accessories will swing and flow with the movement of the characters. Now I will admit, it's a bit unfair to compare fairy tales to Ever After High. Ever After High is like the best use of this animation style I can think of, but even comparing fairy tales to Rooster Teeth's other animations that use this style, you can see how so many of the details have been taken away. Even Camp Camp and Nomad of Nowhere had bounced to their hair and their characters' movements. I do believe strongly in the concept of strength and simplicity, but fairy tales doesn't seem to be trying to use a simpler animation style to strengthen its other aspects. Instead, it just feels like it's using these tactics to cut corners wherever they can. The fact that the background characters are faceless, misshapen humanoid figures more akin to a ghoul than a person is unsettling. It screams of laziness rather than style. And my other biggest issue with the style is the fact that this doesn't look like Ruby. Not even because Ruby is animated with 3D models and this isn't a 2D style. No, nah, like, they just they don't look like Ruby characters. If I didn't know any better, I would have guessed this is for some other project Rooster Teeth was working on. Like, Ruby is very obviously going for an anime style with its art direction, but Fairy Tales is going with a much more traditional Western cartoon approach. Ruby has large eyes and tiny noses, but Fairy Tales has small eyes and wide set noses. This doesn't look right. But then suddenly some characters do share Ruby's proportions? When it comes to the characters who have been introduced in the series proper, suddenly they have their tiny little noses back, and it just kind of feels like a completely different style. Everyone else has these wider noses with this fade effect, but then oops, here's our tiny anime noses. It's almost like they realized no one would recognize these characters with such different proportions or style, so they just completely changed how these characters look. It's especially weird when they're standing next to someone who does have the more defined noses. It makes it look like they're almost from two different shows. It doesn't gel well together, and it doesn't translate very well across mediums. If the Huntsman's children were to show up in Ruby's regular engine, I probably wouldn't be able to recognize them. I just don't understand why they've taken their show with the most unique style compared to their other animations, and completely ignored the style for its direct spin-off. Then the other thing that really made me not interested in watching fairy tales is the fact that 
Honestly, it feels like Ruby homework. There are so many things in Ruby proper that only really make sense if you watch the world of Remnants, and I can't help but feel like the same thing is going to be true with fairy tales. Knowing that these were stories from a supplemental book makes me think at least one of them is going to end up being really important in Volume 9 or something. But Rooster Teeth had the wherewithal to realize not everyone is going to want to drop 10 bucks to read one story from from this book. So the logical option is to animate it, so then you can throw it onto YouTube so people will understand the story better. But if you're gonna do that for one story, might as well make a whole little series out of it, huh? And quite frankly, that's not an unreasonable assumption. In universe, the only fairy tales we've ever heard, sans for the girl who fell through the world, have all become true. Fairy tales are presented as thinly veiled explanations for in-universe history. It's not surprising I came into these episodes expecting them to inform us about some characters' motivations or some plot threads' development. And as of me writing this, there is no real proof that that's what's going to be the case. But I can't get the idea out of my head that I need to watch this series, otherwise I'm going to be left out of the loop somewhere down the line. The moment a supplemental material no longer feels supplemental, it starts to feel like homework. And watching cartoons should never feel like homework. Well, I guess I've prattled on long enough. I think it's time to take a look proper at these six episodes in order to better express the good and bad of this series. Is Oak okay? Just caught a chill in the forest. It's nothing. Unfortunately, I think we're starting the series off with the biggest dud of the bunch. While other stories from fairy tales are definitely much, much more boring, this one is almost incomprehensible. At least if you didn't read the original story beforehand. It's literally to the point where I had to look up what happened in the original story in order to actually understand what the hell was happening in this episode. The point of adapting a story is to make it equally as enjoyable just in a different medium. This episode just fails completely in terms of adaptation in every way. Well, let's go into some specifics. So we start with this girl, Poppy, hanging out in the forest when her brother, Oak, starts calling for her. Wh where'd you go? Come back! Okay, so apparently she's supposed to be hidden within the tree line, but this shot does not convey that at all. Instead, it makes it seem like Oak is blind or something for not being able to see her right in front of him. Now, credit where credit is due. Caden does a great job voicing Poppy. <gasps> see, Oak? Told you so. Your turn. Caden also voices May in Ruby Proper, and it's really great seeing them continue to stretch their voice acting skills here. Especially since these two roles prove that they have a lot of potential to be a fantastic voice actor in general. I really hope they keep it up. Also, I'm gonna be honest, Caden's performance is probably the best in the whole series. Unfortunately, a lot of the other voice performances throughout these episodes sound less than great. <laughs> so the siblings are daring each other to go into the dangerous woods, and even though Poppy just saw a spooky black cloud and ran away from it, she shoves her clearly very afraid brother into the woods, then sits around for like hours? <laughs> Listen, when your brother didn't come running back after the first five minutes, you should have tried doing something right away. So Poppy goes into the forest and finds- oh! What will you learn? Okay, so like, this is where things start to get confusing. She drags him back home looking like this. He looks like Grimm, babes. You should tell someone. And it's not presented like she's afraid she'll get in trouble or anything. She just goes home and puts him in bed. And he's sitting there like fucking this and she just lays down to go to sleep. Did you not tell your parents? This is not normal behavior. Why aren't you telling anyone? Oh God, the feet. <laughs> so like I said, the animation isn't stellar, but this is so ugly. You couldn't have been bothered to like give the idea of separate toes. If her ugly ass potato feet were going to be the main focus of this shot, you'd think they would bother to make them look better. <laughs> You just had Penny's feet in the real show. Fuck, RTAA, the show that constantly jokes around about how they don't draw feet, has had better looking feet. <laughs> Anyways, Poppy wanders around and I think her parents are dead. And despite the fact that something clearly broke through her bedroom window, something else is going through her front door now, 
apparently. She wanders around, finds more dead people, finds Oak just to leave him behind to wander into more dead people's houses. Like, I think she's chasing this black blur thing, but why? Why not stick with Oak? He doesn't seem to be dead yet. Being dead seems to be implied with these twisted scream faces, but Oak looks the same as he did when you brought him out of the forest, so he doesn't look dead. <laughs> Well, what the fuck was that? What, was it this person? They seem to be sitting upright, so they may not be dead yet, right? Why are you running? What's your plan? Where the fuck are you going? If you're going to do horror, you have to give some explanations. Specifically, the actions of our main character needs to be explained. I literally don't understand why Poppy has done anything. Why did she push her brother into the woods despite seeing something in there? Why did she wait for so damn long to go looking for her brother? Why did didn't she tell anyone about his condition? Why did she leave him behind? I'm not scared, I'm just annoyed. I don't get what's happening. I don't understand. And then, I, d I don't even. Why not me? This is so poorly explained. How did she get the grim stuff? Did it transfer to her after touching this boy? Why? Why wasn't it when she touched Oak all those times before? Was it this dark moment before she got home? Why? Why didn't it kick in right away? What? What even is this supposed to be? <laughs> okay, so... Apparently, what happens in the original story is that Oak gets infected with a grim called The Chill. It takes over his body and tricks Poppy into bringing him back into town so it can feed on the other villagers. This silent catatonic shivering thing isn't in the book. Apparently, The Chill is intelligent to some degree, I'm guessing that's what the blue eyes were supposed to be. And apparently this was just a random story to tell the children of the village to warn them about going into the woods. But apparently, and you don't know how many hoops I had to jump through to figure this shit out. Apparently, the intention with this animation adaptation of it is that Ozpin has changed the story to instead act as a warning for Salem. Taking that pre-existing story of the chill and changing the side effects to look like Salem? To use this story as a warning for kids to avoid the wicked witch in the woods? Which is so fucking stupid. This animation doesn't display any of that. Instead, this animation is just a confused, annoying mess that is completely tensionless and leaves zero impact. Hell, it doesn't even portray the concept of tell your parents when you do something wrong. Instead, it just portrays this moral message of don't wait five hours before checking on your brother after putting him in a dangerous situation. What's worse is Ozpen bookends the episode with narration, as if he's the storyteller in this scenario, which continues for most of the episodes. Many stories explore innocence as a blessing and a curse. We expect that evil should be easy to recognize rather than accepting it can lurk behind any face. This narration implies Poppy was too innocent to see her brother has been turned evil, for lack of a better word. But that doesn't make sense. In the context of what the original story sounds like, yeah, it would. This animation doesn't display the idea of a kid's ignorance of evil. This is a kid's ignorance to your brother looking like a fucking demon. <laughs> Worst of all, he doesn't act evil in any way. He doesn't do anything. None of them do. The chill doesn't make people evil, it just seems to make them dead. What a complete failure of a story from an adaptation standpoint, from an animation standpoint, from a basic plot and character standpoint. Without a doubt, this is one of the worsts of the bunch. One day. All of you will use your semblances to help others too. Alright, so our story follows these four siblings, but they never get any official names or anything. So to make things easier for myself, I'm going to give them little nicknames for this review. Let's see, off the top of my head, let's go with Leonardo, Donatello, Michelangelo, and Raphael. You know, just... Just at random. <laughs> so the siblings are discussing their different semblances, arguing over who has the best one. Leonardo can turn invisible. So, May's semblance. Donatello can calm people down. So, Ren's semblance. Michelangelo can link auras. So, Jean's semblance. And Raphael can find whatever's the most helpful for her in the situation. It's a plot convenience. <laughs> 
It's also beyond boring how all their silences look exactly the same. I mean, it's no better than what the show has going for it, so. <laughs> so this faceless ghoul comes in to tell them their dad's been killed off screen, and oh no, they all think their plans and semblances are better than the others. They go their separate ways, do their own thing, blah blah blah. They figure out they work better as a team than on their own, and that's why the schools use teams of four. A concept that's been so long abandoned by the show that it literally hasn't been brought up since volume 3. This one's a real drag. It's seven minutes long and it definitely didn't need to be. You could have easily halved the runtime with this episode and it probably would have benefited the slogging pace. The ending is super easy to predict and that's fine, but they don't go about it in any unique ways whatsoever. Donatello just stumbles upon Leonardo and then they just run into the others and they team up, and that's like it. <laughs> also, side note, I hate how the Grimm look in this animation style. Their fur looks more blurry than like, like fuzzy. I don't know, it just doesn't really mesh well with the rest of the style the show is going for. Are you human? Now this is going to be a real treat for you. I actually find this next one to be the best episode of them all. It's still a little on the slow side, but by all means, this one at least makes me think about the world and development of Remnant. So this episode actually tells us two fairy tales, though they're really just two different versions of the same concept. Faunus parents entertain their children with bedtime stories about where they came from. A culturally specific fairy tale sounds super interesting. These stories introduce the god of animals. This monstrosity. <laughs> Story number one tells us about how the god invited people who didn't fit in with others and offers them to step into the shallow sea. Those who do come out with animal features. Those who don't go back to where they came from. Though the sea did not touch you, it has revealed your own shallowness. This short story is really solid, and honestly, I wish more of these fairy tales were short and to the point like this. Not that the theatrics of the different fairy tales are bad necessarily, but I think the message keeps getting lost in the drawn out runtimes. We then transition to our second story, where man and animals are at war with each other. Man are upset that the animals don't help them with fighting the Grimm, and the animals are upset that the humans destroy nature in order to build things. Once again, the god of animals steps in and offers to end the war, but only if they accept his judgment. Both parties agree, assuming the god will be in their favor, but then he turns the tables and fuses them together into one. Each side grows the others' problems and their strengths. An outcome that everyone seems pretty jazzed about in the end. Though unfortunately, it means they've gained a common enemy, both with the Grimm and with the humans. Yet they reflect the real and unfortunate history of conflicts between humans and Faunus. Like I said, this one definitely is the best. It's a little slow in the middle, especially during the God of Animals' talk with the human and the panther, but I like the idea of these stories. More interesting though is the concept of the God of Animals. Crow mentions that there are supposedly a bunch of different religions in Remnant, and I like that idea that there are Faunus who believe in the God of Animals. To them, these stories wouldn't be fairy tales, but more akin to religious scripture, like Bible stories. It does have this unfortunate concept in hindsight, seeing how nothing like this in the show proper has ever been hinted at with the Faunus. Well hell, there's actually no real religion in any form in the show proper, except for Salem and Ozma's cult. <laughs> now Ruby proper already didn't handle racial discrimination very well, and I really don't think they would have handled religious discrimination any better, so maybe it's a good thing it never got brought up in the show proper. But like, Conceptually, it does make the world of Remnant a lot more interesting. What happens to the mortal mind? when it has more knowledge than it is capable of bearing. And now it's back down to Boarsville with the also way too long, the indecisive king. Ugh. Also, that question, what happens to the mortal mind when there's too much knowledge to bear? Yeah, that doesn't get answered in any way. Also, this shot of the king freaking out is only in the first 30 seconds of the video, so a whole lot of lies right at the beginning here. <laughs> the king does shit like answers people's is honestly super petty questions. Oh boy. Should I eat a burrito or a sandwich for lunch today? Eat a burrito. It spills less and they taste fucking amazing. Yay! 
something. Like this bitch. She shows up and she needs help and he's all, yeah, whatever, you can hang out. But like, the only thing I can focus on is the fact that she only has four fingers on each hand. Why? Literally no other character has this sort of thing. Is it an intentional birth defect they've given this character? Why? Was it on accident? You guys couldn't be bothered to double check the amount of fucking fingers on one of the main characters? Creatures of Grimm destroyed my entire village. Okay, stop. Rooster Teeth does this sometimes, and I fucking hate it. Where they'll animate someone's face to be way more emotional than the actual performance. This lady's line delivery is much more solemn and heartbroken. Creatures of Grimm destroyed my entire village. Yet they decided to make her look randomly mega pissed for like one word. It's dumb. It's bad. Do better. Pay the fuck attention to your actors' line delivery. Or direct your actors to give the delivery you're looking for. Jeez. <laughs> Anyways, some creepy dude gives the king this crown, which I'm pretty sure is supposed to be the relic of knowledge. It's a crown. We've discussed knowledge in the beginning of the video. See, this is the sort of thing I was afraid of. The show will definitely expect us to have read this story story or at least watched this animation in order to get an idea of the explanation on how the crown works. I don't want to have to watch this droning, super crappy animation just to understand how one of the key items of the show works. If it's important to the show's main plot, it should be established in the show itself not this side project. It's not supplemental, it's just homework. So apparently he sees like war and shit when he puts the crown on and Okay. For some reason, this worries him so much, he becomes an indecisive king. So that means he, like, can't figure out how to help the people's petty questions anymore. And you know what? Figure it out your fucking selves, guys. He's a king. He has way more important shit to handle than, Oh, should I marry the hot boy or the rich boy? Wah. And who are they? Wow, such good pacing. I'm glad we can stretch this paper-thin excuse of a story out past seven minutes with amazing animation techniques like standing completely fucking still and not talking whatsoever. So she puts the crown on to help the king, but she sees, like, them getting married? Why? Why did he see war but she sees love? Is it random for everyone? Is it because of their genders? Is it because she's a faunus and he's a human? There's way too many variables to understand the concepts of how this crown is supposed to work. God, this stupid fucking sideshow is trying to explain the crown's rules, but it can't even do that right. So this fucking bitch, okay, the king is like, yeah, I saw something super bad, but now I have the time to plan ahead and try to make sure it doesn't happen. And she's like, if you only concern yourself with the future, you will miss the good things right in front of your eyes. Oh yeah, that's real easy for you to say when the only thing in your foreseeable future is riding that king cock, but he's trying to prevent catastrophic war. Could you imagine if someone was given a glimpse of the future and they were like, I can save everyone, and someone told them, eh, don't worry about it, that's the future. Worry about it when it gets here. <laughs> What? I'm fucking- I'm blown away. I didn't realize how much I hated this episode until just now. The first time I watched it, I was so bored. I was mostly thinking about how it makes no sense to make the lady here a faunus. Like, how can we say there are faunus racisms if our royalty have been marrying faunus for seemingly generations? You're gonna have this happening hot off the heels of the Shallow Sea episode? Remember how I said the Grim Child was the worst? I was wrong. This is hands down the shittiest episode of the bunch. The Grim Child was bad because it made no fucking sense, but this is bad because it doesn't make sense with how the relic is supposed to work, but the parts that do make sense have an ass backwards message. Fuck you. Boo! You stink! This fairy tale is unique on Remnant in that the protagonist writes her own story. So, the girl in the tower is the story of Salem, specifically the part about living in the tower before being rescued by Ozma. And I know what you're thinking. Wait, isn't there a whole 30 minute long episode dedicated to the story in the show proper? Yes, but in this little five minute long video, it covers all the shit that went unexplained. So if you had any questions about how this story actually worked, you can now look it up here, you know, 
like homework. <laughs> All those honestly valid questions we had after watching The Lost Fable, like why did her dad lock her up? Why didn't she just jump out the window? Get answered very easily here. Listen, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. This whole episode feels like they're just trying to band-aid this whole concept because they realize they never answered any of these very valid questions. But here's the problem. You can't expect your audience to also watch these crappy little episodes on top of watching the show proper. Every single single creator of media should 100% expect their audience to not engage with any of its supplemental material. Especially Ruby, because there's actually a ton of supplemental stuff. Between the trailers, the world of remnants, mangas, comics, chibi, and now this, there's a shit ton of Ruby stuff. And expecting your audience to engage with all of it is ridiculous. I can't help but feel like RT continually uses its supplemental material to fix things they didn't quite get right in the show. Oh, Oh, we didn't show the kids having a good enough friendship with each other while at Beacon? We can fix that in Ruby Chibi. Oh, we didn't explain Blake and Adam's relationship at all in the show? That's alright, we can cover that in the DC comics. We didn't explain some of the basic world building? Let's make the world of remnants, that'll fix this problem. And now this episode is just a shining cherry on top of this concept, to the point where it almost feels like they made this whole anthology series just to make this episode available to the public. That way people will stop asking these questions over and over and over again. Oh, we didn't explain why Salem was locked up and why she couldn't just escape out of her gigantic window? Well, let's make this half-assed animation to quickly go over these things that could have very easily been in the episode proper. But we didn't actually think about these answers until after we released the episode. And yeah, they also put the answer in their book, but no one wanted to read that. Gotta put it on YouTube for free. Otherwise, no one will want to watch it. Because heaven knows most people bitch too much about watching Ruby proper on Rooster Teeth's site, even though that's free too. Ew, the ads, wah. Please, this is nothing compared to Crunchyroll or early YouTube. <laughs> about this actual episode itself, it's fine. Slow, boring, I kind of hate the montage of her reading slash writing. Cause like, you could tell they understood a girl sitting around and reading was gonna be boring to look at. So they put her in a bunch of stupid poses, just like, ugh. It's not for me. It's more distracting than anything else. Also, this episode has like way more production value. Like the turning of the gears and clicking the scenes into place feels way more refined than the other episodes. Like, I'm not kidding. It really does feel like this was the only episode they really wanted to animate, but had to make a whole series to justify it. Tomorrow I'll be 16 and I have never even stepped outside. 16? Wait, wait, wait. You're telling me this is a 16? 16 year old? At the very oldest, that means she's gotta be 17 or maybe 18, but damn, she looks like she's in her mid to late 20s. She looks way older than any of our heroes who are all also 16 to 18. I thought this was a grown ass woman still listening to her father. Knowing that she's 16 really changes the way I see this. See, this is just more retconning stuff and exposition in hindsight. <sighs> I like the idea of Salem writing her own story and by painting her dad as some evil king, it just pushes the notion that Salem really never was a good person. Salem's always been selfish and manipulative, and I like how this episode helps to hammer that home. Though apparently in the book, her dad was already shitty to his subjects, and that kind of undermines the whole point of establishing Salem's villainy. Though beyond that, there really is just nothing else worth talking about. Other than the extra exposition for Salem's backstory, this episode is just slow and boring. I fell for her the moment I saw her silver eyes. This next one is really unique because this is the only one where Ozpin isn't the narrator. Instead, it's presented to us as Ty reading a storybook to Ruby and Yang. And honestly, I really like this idea. It's super cute, especially with this part. The people became complacent. Complacent? Oh, uh, careless. 
Oh. I love the idea of having an active storyteller and an active listener for these stories. Honestly, it makes me wish the rest of the episodes were like that too. It could have helped paint these stories as conversations rather than just Ozpin recounting his gloomy past. <laughs> also, the choice of who was narrating and who was listening could have helped elevate the way the stories are delivered. It makes sense for Ozpin to recount the girl in the tower story, but what if we played around with the others a little bit? Like, for the grim child, Child, I could picture Salem being the narrator here. I can picture her conjuring up some horrifying beast that instantly kills people. A horrifying story to hammer home how defenseless humanity is against her grim, but also to try to convince people to stay out of the woods and leave her alone. For the indecisive king, I could picture either Winter or Klein telling the story to Weiss and Whitley, and then the two younger siblings could be arguing over which of the options was best for the king to take. For the hunter's children, I think it would have been cool if Oscar was reading the story, maybe even trying to better understand why Ozpin uses the teams of four. And for the shallow sea, it could have been a story told to baby Blake, where Kali tells her one story and Gira tells her the other version. Or it could have been a conversation between Blake and Sun, each one telling the story they heard growing up about where Fawn has come from. It's just such an interesting idea that could have helped give these episodes a little bit more creativity with its execution, and I'm really disappointed they didn't push the limits with this concept. Concept. One story and then it's bedtime, okay? I mean it. Okay, Daddy. I'll be honest, Ruby's voice is already so high-pitched that I almost didn't realize this was supposed to be a much younger version of her. So this little boy of undetermined age, I can't tell if he's like 7 or 17, <laughs> runs into the woods and comes across a warrior who's been killing Grimm to keep everyone safe. And um... I guess it's time to tackle the elephant in the room. In the original version of the story, the warrior had dark skin and super curly hair, but in this episode, she's depicted with straight hair and very light skin. <sighs> I understand that the intention is that this woman is supposed to look like Summer or Ruby, since the story reminds Ty of them and he's our narrator. But like, no, just... Just no, whitewashing in any form is not cool, and if this was the direction they were going for, they should have made that clear in the original book. And quite frankly, I don't think it really would have been all that necessary anyway. I think just the silver eyes alone would have helped hammer home the concept that Ty relates this story to Summer. It's also implied that he's sort of projecting himself onto this little boy who falls in love with the silver-eyed woman in the story, hence the blue eyes and blonde hair, but that also is kind of weird, because like I mentioned, I don't know this kid's age. He's young enough to be chasing bugs all day, and this woman seems to be like a fully grown-ass woman. <laughs> so to project yourself onto this little child, and then to project your wife onto this much older woman, it just feels weird. It feels weird that this story went with a romantic angle at all. When I first watched this animation, I thought I was going for a more mentor-student type of relationship. So to suddenly make it about romance at the end, just to make this half-assed connection between Ty and one of his wives, is just weak and confusing, and it didn't help elevate the story in any way. Just no matter which way I look at it, it really didn't seem necessary to change the warriors' skin tone. The story would have conveyed its meanings, even with a woman with dark skin. While we're on the warrior, though, one little thing, I hate her mouth. <laughs> like, what's with this triangle thing going on? Like, I think they're trying to make her look cute, but I hate it. <laughs> no one else has a mouth like this, and it's just kind of distracting. Anyways, the story is boring again, and honestly feels a little too long. Ty promised the girls the story would have monsters and fighting, but honestly that doesn't add up to much. And I'm not even sure what was the point of the story. Like, what message is it trying to tell? To tell people about those who help them? To not become complacent in your safety? That even if you fall in love with someone, keep coming back to talk to them, even if they expressly tell you to stop doing so? <laughs> I don't know, it's just a bit of a flop to end the series on, but honestly the whole series was kind of a flop anyways. You have your mother's eyes. So yeah, I was not impressed with fairy tales. Only one episode was actually interesting, and most of the others were just a bore. As far as Ruby's supplemental materials go, this one is probably one of the worst. It screams of laziness and a distinct lack of creativity. Half of the morals the stories are telling are confused or just completely miss the mark. This series really does reek of desperately trying to push certain expositions 
composition out in order to get ready for the next volume, because they failed to actually properly set it up in the show proper. Beyond that, it also just kind of feels like Rooster Teeth wanted to run something Ruby related during this time, since the new volumes usually come out around the end of the year, but volume 9 has been pushed back to 2022. So they just quickly threw together a handful of easy to animate stories from their book and called it a day. As an adaptation, it's surprising how poorly they've handled adapting their own stories. Whether it's getting the plot so confused it makes no sense, to failing to accurately adapt a character's design, to just being boring to look at. I think I would have rather read these stories myself because that way I could have imagined something a bit more creative and fun to look at than this. <laughs> I don't expect a season 2, and I really don't want one. This was just a huge waste of time and animation effort. Sorry, RT, but just because you slap Ruby into the title, that doesn't mean it'll automatically be worth watching. Major fairy fail. Shout out to my $10 patrons, you're all amazing. Nako, James Dodds, Cool Duck, Andrew, Ramiel, Valhalla Knight, Chamomile, G Extreme, Classy Critic, Mordred Pendragon, Boulder Off Bros, Sunny Shy, Great Bar, Caleb Grimm, Pentimenta, Genital War Thunder, Jake, Storm, Amber, Lolith, Livid Ares, Hype Man, Luno the Evoker, Zero to Hero, Keith and Coleman, and Isaiah. So yeah, thank you for watching this video. I didn't expect it to be this long. Like I started writing the script and I'll be like, haha, yes, this will be like a nice 10 minute video. And then it and then it was this. <laughs> So yeah, tell me what you think about all these fairy tales. Like, have you read the book? Would you think the book conveyed these concepts better than the animations? What do you think of the actual episodes themselves? Do you agree or disagree with anything I said? Any and all thoughts and opinions, leave them in the comments below, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.